Thank you so much for coming. Michael and I are both really thrilled to be here. I want to start with a quick story about my daughter. Um, a few years ago, when she was nine years old, I had her captive in the car, and I said, hey, honey, did you know that our national debt is $19 trillion? She loves being in the car with me. And she said, uh, you know, really? And I said, yes. And guess who's going to have to pay that back? She's a little concerned. You? Oh, no, honey. That's not how it works. You, you're going to have to pay that back. So now she's quite horrified and says, me? What did I ever do? So as you can tell from the conversations that I force upon my children in the car, I care deeply about our political system. And that is what has brought me to be with you today. There is so much talk about our divided country that I want to begin with a statement on which virtually everybody does have agreement. Washington is broken. We say it all the time. But as my good friend, current vice president here at Aspen Institute, and also a former congressman, Mickey Edwards, originally explained, Washington is broken represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. In fact, it turns out that Washington is doing exactly what it's designed to do. So the rational question is, how can it be so perfectly designed and yet deliver such dismal results? And the answer is that it's simply not designed for us, the citizens, the public interest. In reality, today's system has been designed and continuously fine-tuned over decades by and for the benefit of two private gain-seeking organizations. These are our two political parties and their industry allies, which together comprise what we call the political industrial complex. And essentially, the needs of the political industrial complex simply don't align in general with the true needs of the country. So that structure, that design of our system, creates a huge problem which I'd like to illustrate with a Venn diagram. Currently, there is no intersection, no connection between our elected representatives acting in the public interest and the likelihood of their getting reelected. So in other words, if America's elected representatives do their jobs the way we need them to, they're likely to lose those jobs. And that's a crazy design. But fortunately, it's also optional. We can change the design, and the solutions to do that are what today's discussion is about. So in 2016, I asked Michael Porter to join me on a new approach to fixing our politics using the tools of competition and industry analysis that have been for decades the gold standard in understanding competition in for-profit industries. And these tools were originally developed by Michael. Using these tools to look at politics sheds new light on our problems because politics in America has become a major industry. And it functions similarly to other industries. Our political problems are not due to a single cause, but rather to a failure of the nature of political competition that's been created. This is a systems problem. The purpose of our work is very simple. We wanted to figure out precisely what it would take to change the system powerfully enough to change the results that the system regularly delivers. And it turns out the most powerful results, the most powerful solutions, center around the very foundation of our democracy, how we vote. The political innovations that we will recommend to you today will break partisan gridlock and drive accountability for real solutions for the country. Please know that when we both talk today, it's certainly about politics, but it's not political. Michael is a Massachusetts Republican. I used to be a Democrat. Now I'm a politically homeless, centrist independent. And the problem is not Democrats or Republicans or even the existence of parties, per se. The problem is not individual politicians. The problem is indeed the system. First, Michael's going to review what's at stake. 
And then I'll be back up to talk about uh, how it's all screwed up and who's to blame, but most importantly, how to fix it. Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Catherine, and thank you all for being here. And, and we truly hope that this doesn't cast a cloud over the rest of your day. But this is something that has enormous impact on our country and our society. And so let's talk a little bit about that and, and how we came to understand this. So as many of you know, I'm a strategy professor. I work on competition and strategy. I also work with countries and states on economic development and social development. Um, and as a result of that background, uh, I began in 2010 to co-chair a multi-year project at Harvard Business School which we call the US Competitiveness Project. And the reason we did this was we were seeing really disturbing uh, economic performance uh, in America that, just, that started well before the Great Recession, back in the late eight, 18, 1980s and, and 1990. Um, and uh, we wanted to really dig in and see what uh, was going on here. Because these were long-term trends that broke for the, in the wrong direction. Now, as a policy guy, uh, politics was the last thing, I, I swear to you, the last thing I ever thought I would work on. Uh, but that all changed. That all changed because of Catherine, who helped me understand just how much is at stake here. And it's hard to overestimate that. Now, if you look at uh, some of the data that we collected, uh, this is a classic HBS 2 by 2 matrix. This is based on the survey of all of our HBS alumni from uh, all over the country in many different industries. Um, and uh, it's also vetted by looking at all the actual uh, hard data that exists. So what we see here is that uh, in the upper right-hand corner, America has amazing strengths. Strengths in entrepreneurship, strengths in innovation, uh, and others you see, great universities. Um, and, and fortunately, we have those strengths. Those are precious. Those are very unique in the world. But what we also see is uh, in the lower left-hand quadrant, uh, we see uh, some alarming weaknesses. Things like inadequate worker skills, things like uh, poor infrastructure, things like uh, very complicated regulation that's costly to deal with, high-cost legal system, high-cost health care system, and more. And these weaknesses have been leading to rising inequality among our citizens, to not Americans, to many Americans not actually earning an average uh, or a living wage. Uh, and we also, and this is not well known, we also are at today a 40-year low, 40, 40-year low, in the pr proportion of Americans of working age that are actually engaged in the economy. Uh, this is called workforce participation. Our best estimate, actually, is that true unemployment, the real live number from a human point of view, is actually still over 10%. It's not the 3% you hear. Because that way they calculate the 3% really leaves out a lot of the most important uh, impacted citizens uh, in the economy. So um, if, you, if you look at, uh, at this chart, uh, what you see is if you look at the good part of it, the upper right, uh, and you ask yourself, who's responsible for those things in the upper right? What do we see? Well, the answer is the private sector. These are all things that the private sector does. If you look uh, up down below, and particularly to the left, and you, and you see, well, who's responsible for all those things? Well, I think, unfortunately, the answer is government. These are the responsibility of government. And uh, these things uh, that government is responsible for have only been getting worse. And you also see that box down there. We asked our alumni what was the most single, most concerning economic problem facing the United States. And they answered overwhelmingly, our political system. I was surprised by this. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a competitiveness guy. Uh, I was really focusing on, uh, on, on the core uh, economic uh, competition and, and not so much seeing the big picture. As a result of this analysis, we put forward what we called an eight-point plan of the most pressing areas where the federal government in America needed to fix things. And we, many, took, many trips to Washington, talking with members of Congress about the diagnosis and about what we need to do. And you know what? 
every single member we talked to agreed with both. They agreed with what was going wrong, and they agreed with what we needed to do. But the surprising thing uh, is that nothing has gotten done on any of those areas. And we look back for decades. Uh, we have not made any real progress on any of the key economic problems uh, our economy faces. And we haven't made progress in decades. This is not a new thing. This is a sustained thing. Now, this may sound uh, bad enough, and it is, but it actually gets worse. Because uh, uh, economics is only half the government's job. We need to make progress on social performance. Uh, things like health, things like uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity, all kinds of social dimensions that are uh, not crucial just in and of themselves, but they're also crucial for economic performance. If we don't keep making progress on the social side, we're going to run out of steam on the economic side. And that is, as we'll see in a minute, what's been going on. Most of us think of this country as a leader in social performance. We invented many critical social policies, like universal public education, made in America, invented in America. But, uh, but historically, as we thought so well about ourselves, there's been no way of really measuring how well we're doing on social performance, which is ultimately one of the key things government's supposed to deliver. So uh, I led another project uh, called the Social Progress Index, where we put together, finally, the data objective data that allowed us to, first, for the first time, benchmark across many, many countries in terms of how we were doing on social progress. And so let's, let's take a look at, uh, at what we found. And hope there, there we go. Uh, what this chart does is it compares America to the OECD countries. These are the uh, 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 36 other higher income countries that are really our peers in the economy. And uh, if you look at this chart, uh, uh, at least I was very, very surprised. As a pioneer in almost everything on this chart, America is now sunk to the bottom of the OECD countries. You know, we're number 35 in secondary school enrollment, 35 in the world. Uh, we're uh, 34th in the homicide rate. This is a very dangerous place. Uh, we're 28th in discrimination and violence against minorities and other measures of poor inclusion. Uh, we're 33rd and 35th in child mortality and maternal mortality. Does this sound like the United States of America? When, when, with our technology, with our expertise, with our leadership, this level of performance? And by the way, there's many other problems in healthcare, in gun violence, in having safe water in having a reasonable immigration policy, and many, many others. And what we've discovered through this work is our social performance is actually declining in this country. And this is really the root cause of inequality. Because poor social performance leads to poor opportunity and, uh, uh, and many of the other uh, economic problems we face today. We can now actually measure objectively how our government is doing. And the answer is, not good. Uh, what matters here is not political drama. It's not who said what to who. Uh, it's the results. Are we delivering the results that the nation and the citizens need? Uh, and the answer is, no. Our government is failing. It's no longer moving this country forward in the ways that we expected to. Uh, and we know what we need to do. We truly do. We just can't do it. Why not? What's wrong? And here's where I made a fundamental misunderstanding, or had a fundamental misunderstanding, as I approached this question as a policy scholar. I thought we had a policy problem when this, when this all, work all started. I thought it was, you know, we have the wrong policy. Well, not really. Uh, the next thing I thought was, oh, we have a politician problem. The wrong people are in office. But what Catherine helped me understand, and what I think we now have great clarity on, is the problem is not neither of those things. The problem is we have a problem with our political system. It's not designed to deliver the solutions we need. Uh, and Catherine is, uh, also had this incredible idea that said, we could look at politics as an industry. 
It's a big industry now, massive amounts of money involved. And if we analyze the way the parties are competing, on what and for whom, that would give us an insight into what are the root causes of all this, which have been creeping on us for now several decades. So I joined her work in 2016 and have been truly obsessed with this ever since. I've forgotten I was an economist now. I, I'm now a political scientist. Uh, and uh, the question is, the reason why is if we can't change the trajectory of the results our government is achieving, uh, our performance as a nation is going to suffer badly, and the division in our society is only going to get worse. Uh, so let me turn it back over to Catherine and ask her to discuss why is this happening. We've given you a little taste of it, but there's a lot more to understand. Catherine. Thank you, Michael. OK, so we're going to go back to Washington is broken. As I said, that's not actually the case. Washington's working exactly how it's designed to work. And it's designed by and for the benefit of the duopoly, the two sides of the political industrial complex, not for citizens, not for voters, not for the public interest. So with just a peek under the proverbial hood, we can see that the pol political system actually works much differently than most of us have assumed. So I'm going to give you two quick real life examples. Think back to 2009, Joe Biden becomes vice president. And everybody in Delaware, I'm told, knew who was going to be their next senator to take his seat from the state of Delaware. And that was a gentleman named Mike Castle, most popular politician in the state, multiple-term congressman, multiple-term governor. And uh, he was slated to win. Mike Castle ran in his Republican primary, and he lost. Now, this was very shocking, but theoretically not insurmountable, because after all, that's just the primary. So Mike Castle could put his name on the ballot as an independent in November when more people turn out, and he would win, because he's the most popular guy. Of course, we have never heard of Senator Mike Castle. And the reason for that is that Delaware has a rather odd law. And it's called the Sore Loser Law. And what that says is, if you run in your party's primary, Democrat or Republican, and you lose, you are not permitted to have your name on the general election ballot in November, regardless of what the citizens want. So a rational question is, how many states? How many states have a crazy, undemocratic law like this one? And the answer is 44. And we're sitting in one today. Remember, when Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman lost his 2006 primary, but then he ran as an independent in the general election and won, proving that that's who the voters of Connecticut wanted for their senator. The only reason Joe Lieberman could do that is because Connecticut was one of then only four states without a sore loser law. There's a few other things that we should all become aware of about partisan primaries. They may be publicly funded, but if you think about it, they're actually selection processes for the standard bearer for private partisan organizations. And primaries are the reason why so many of us show up at the general election and think, I really don't love the choices that I have. Because most elections are really decided in the primary, especially in gerrymandered districts. And voters who turn out for pri partisan primaries tend to be more ideological than voters as a whole. And therefore, candidates go further to the right and the left than voters as a whole really want. But even more alarming than the part is that the partisan primary influence extends into actually governing, passing or not legislation. So imagine yourself for a moment as a politician. It's not just what you have to say to get elected. It's that now you've been elected, and you have an opportunity in Washington, DC, to sign, to vote yes, on a bipartisan compromise piece of legislation on one of the biggest problems that Michael just discussed that we're facing as a country. The questions that you must ask yourself are they, is this a good idea? Is this the right thing for the country? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? It's none of those. The question you have to ask is, 
will I make it back through my partisan primary if I vote for this? And if the answer to that question is no, and on the difficult issues it almost always is, then the, rash, then the answers to all the previous questions are virtually wholly irrelevant because the rational incentive to get reelected dictates that you vote no. Now, occasionally, principal might win the day, and you decide to vote yes anyway. And then what happens? You will likely be threatened with a primary. You may have noticed that primary has ceased to be just a noun. It is now a verb as in, we're going to primary you. And what that means, if you're a Republican, is we're gonna run someone further to your right and take you out. If you're a Democrat, it means we're gonna run someone further to your left and take you out. Never has it meant that we are going to run a more rational, consensus, problem-solving, oriented candidate to the middle. And partisan primaries combined with partisan gerrymandering are two key tools that the duopoly uses to control the political process and it effectively forces our elected officials both right and left, and this makes it very difficult to govern. So we can start to understand why so little gets done in Washington, D.C. Now I want to consider a second example of a partisan system, and this is an example from governing, not from elections, but actually legislating. Because we see that the duopoly also perverts governance by controlling the legislative machinery. That's our term for the norms and practices and rules of how laws actually get made. The Hastert rule, for example, is a particularly egregious example of party control taking precedence over the legislature's ability to work collectively, even when constituents want it. So let me describe it for you. The Hastert rule is a well-accepted practice of all speakers of the House, Republicans and Democrats. And what it says is that the speaker will not allow a floor vote on a piece of legislation unless a majority of the majority party, which is to say the speaker's party, supports that legislation, even if a majority of the entire House would vote to pass it. So unless speakers ignore this practice, which they do from time to time, but rarely, legislation supported by a majority of the country very often has no chance of passing because there's never even going to be a vote in our democracy. So let's consider, for example, the 2013 government shutdown. This shutdown could have been entirely averted or ended earlier if then Speaker John Boehner had allowed a floor vote on legislation that was already passed by the Senate and was supported from day one by a majority of the House, which is to say virtually all the Democrats plus a minority of Republicans. And in fact, the shutdown ended only when Speaker Hastert broke with his party and broke a Speaker uh, Boehner, thank you, Speaker Boehner broke with his party and broke the Hastert rule to allow the vote. So effectively, this completely made up rule cements majority party control in a legislature that is supposed to represent all US citizens. And in this particular case, it costs the country $24 billion for a 16-day shutdown that 90% of Americans didn't support from the start. So think about it for a moment in the context of your own organizations. If you wanted to solve your biggest problems, I suspect one thing you might not do is bring everybody together in a room like this and then say, hold on just a minute. Before we get started, I want to count off by twos, and then we'll divide into warring teams and get straight to work. But effectively, that is Washington, D.C. every single day. Our founders warned against political parties to a man. John Adams said, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. Clearly, politics doesn't work exactly how Schoolhouse Rock once taught me that it did. 
I, I recruited some laughing people over here, but they are not doing their job. Um, you got to wake up. OK. My daughter, her, this, this next one's better. My daughter has a favorite joke. I promised I'd share it with you. If con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? <laughs> she's, she's funnier than I am. Uh, in the duopoly, the players advance their own interests instead of the public interest. And what's unique about the politics industry as compared to every other industry is that there's no independent regulation. The actors in the industry are the ones that themselves make and police the rules of the game. Many of us think that the rules of the game are actually set in the Constitution, but that's not true. It turns out that the rules, most of the rules that govern the incentives that drive day-to-day -day behavior are set by and for the political industrial complex and for their benefit. For example, you've all heard of the pocket Constitution, and here is mine. In this powerful but small document, there are six tiny paragraphs dictating how the House and the Senate should work. And this is the House Rules Book. This is 1,500 pages of legislative machinery. It is, well, I, I know without reading, and I admit, I, even in all our research, I have not read it. What's not in here is best practices of problem solving. What we have is a book about how to divide up the spoils of power. This is a book that entrenches partisanship in legislating, a book made up to serve partisans, not to solve problems. And I think it gives new meaning to government over-regulation. If I didn't want to waste more paper, I would pile on top of here an identical uh, column making up the Senate rules book. And I'll just leave that here so we can get some inspiration from it. As is always the case in life, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played. And the net result of the rules of the game operating today in politics is unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition in elections and unhealthy competition in the process of legislating. And the result of unhealthy competition in every industry is that customers are not well served. So thus, the actors in the political system are thriving, and yet the American public has never been more dissatisfied. Just last fall, a new Gallup poll came out, and 61% of Americans think a new major third party is needed. And the percentage of Americans self-identifying as independents is at an all-time high as of last July, 43% independents. And this compares with 29% identifying as Democrats, 25% Republicans. In any other industry this large, this thriving for the players in the industry, with this much customer dissatisfaction, some entrepreneur, I always say someone from Kellogg Business School where I went, Michael kind of thinks it's HBS, but nonetheless, some entrepreneur would see this as a phenomenal business opportunity, and they would create a new competitor responding to what customers want. But that doesn't happen in politics, because as Michael's going to show you in a moment, the, industry, the duopoly works very well together in one particular way, and that is to rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. They erect huge barriers to entry. Put another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. <laughs> this looks like a promising antitrust case, but you won't now be surprised to know that ever so conveniently, antitrust legislation doesn't apply to the politics industry. 
And troublingly, there's no accountability for this, and there's no accountability because the customer only has two choices. The only thing that either side has to do to win is to convince the average voter to choose them as the lesser of two evils, or because at least they say, therefore, what that voter believes. But what the parties don't have to do in this duopoly is to deliver results. Because no matter how disappointed you are, you still likely prefer what your side says therefore than what the one other side says therefore. So therefore, instead of results in the public interest, we get gridlock. This chart shows the percentage of salient issues, meaning the big stuff, that's gridlocked in Congress. And we see a relentless increase from 1947 to today, leading to the high watermark of 74% of issues gridlocked in 2014. And when we do get something done, it's partisan. So here we see a striking implication of the industry structure. Landmark legislation used to pass with bipartisan support. So see the combination of red and blue votes starting at the left for Social Security, highways, civil rights, Medicare welfare reform. But today, important legislation is only passed on partisan lines. So you'll see all blue for health care and Dodd-Frank and all red for tax cuts. And when the other party retakes power, they focus not on improving, but on repealing. This happens in part because there simply aren't enough moderates left to bridge the gaps between the two sides. This slide shows the decline in moderates over time on both Republican and Democrat sides. And everyone knows it's broken. Look here at the dramatic decline in public trust from 1958 to 2017. Now, if the competition in the politics industry were healthy, industry actors would be competing to serve, to advance the public interest, and they would be held accountable for that but as we've just illuminated, they aren't. Why not? Let's use the tools under Michael's guidance to understand the industry structure. Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Catherine. And now uh, let's go back to really the core of what the competition that's going on here that isn't delivering what we need. Why is that? Uh, why isn't it serving the public interest? And uh, to understand that, we have to realize that we can look at this competition between Democrats and Republicans just like we can look at any competition in any industry. It's the same basic ideas. Now, uh, hopefully uh, a few or many of you in this room have been exposed to the what's called the five forces framework. Anybody in business school probably was forced to learn that, uh, which I'm, I'm grateful for. Uh, which provides a holistic way of looking at an industry and looking at the kind of structure that will then drive the nature of competition uh, in that industry. Um, and, and, and this is kind of a, a slide that kind of describes just what those five forces look like in politics. Uh, at the core of any industry competition is the rivals, Coke versus Pepsi, uh, in the politics industry, as Catherine has said, the rivalry is between our two dominant political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, and they're fighting it out. They're competing to win elections, and they're competing to get their way in governing, to pass the kind of policies they like. Okay? So there's this fierce competition between these, these two rivals, uh, which is really at the core of, of this industry. Uh, we see, though, that uh, the, the rivals, the parties, are really surrounded by a number of other actors that are also having an influence on the nature of, of competition and also the ability to sustain uh, their dominance in the industry. Um, and and this, this set of actors that you see here is what really are the political industrial complex. It's, it's the suppliers. Uh, it's, well, it starts with the customers. Customers are us in this industry. Uh, but as we'll see, not all customers are equally important to the parties. Like all smart business people, they choose the customers they're going to target. They're not just competing for everybody. Uh, the parties uh, uh, reach us, citizens, through various channels of, 
of getting their word across, getting their ideas across. Uh, and you see the channels. There's the direct engagement, uh, what's called the ground game. There's advertising. There's independent media. Uh, there's social media. There's a variety of channels that, that are used to communicate with us. Uh, and and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in, 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 in a bit because they are, and the shifts in those channels have shifted the nature of competition, unfortunately not in a powerful way. Uh, like in every industry, the parties depend on suppliers of the critical technology and talent uh, and data that they need to compete. And you see the key suppliers there. I mean, it starts with candidates, uh, but then there's the campaign talent. So. Uh, today, uh, in this system today, uh, you will see uh, a very odd situation with respect to the supplier relationship with the parties. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, a crucial aspect of every industry that Catherine's already mentioned is what are the barriers to entry of new competition that would do it in a different way? Uh, in politics, a new competitor would be a new party. And we all kind of know that we've never heard of any of the new parties after a year or two. They all go away. And then the final part of industry structure is what we call here substitutes. These are disruptors. These are uh, new competitors that figure out that they should compete in a different way than the incumbents are, are competing, uh, like Uber versus the taxi industry. That's a disruptor. Um, and in politics, a, a disruptor or a substitute could be for example, independent candidates running without, their, without a party at all. Um, and as we see, a lot of Americans identify themselves as independents. So why can't a large majority of Americans actually elect any independents? That becomes a very, very important question to understand. So let's use this lens to understand the root causes of dysfunctional, unhealthy competition, polarization, it's all about this poll versus that poll, never the middle. Gridlock, we don't get much done. Uh, and finally, lack of solutions. We don't move the ball forward. How does that emerge from this industry structure? And let me just highlight a few of the critical dimensions here. The first critical dimension is there's only two competitors. And they dominate the industry. And that has a lot, a big effect on how uh, these organizations set their strategy. It also has a very profound effect on something Catherine mentioned a minute ago, and that is their willingness to cooperate. There's only two of them. And they cooperate in many areas at the same time as they're competing fiercely, as we've described. Uh, the second key idea here that we all have to understand, and it's very depressing, the core customers of the parties are not the average voter. That's not who they're trying to reach. Um, in any business, the savvy uh, competitors try to identify the most profitable customers, the, prosper, uh, the customers that will deliver the most benefit if we can win them over. And in this uh, industry, uh, the, parties, uh, the parties are really going after um, the uh, a core customer group, which consists of really two, two segments of the industry. One is the partisan primary voter. Now, we all know that partisan primary voters are more ideological. They are more partisan. Uh, so those are one of the core, core segments in which the parties are, are trying to deliver. And the other core segment of customers is special interest, and there's lots of special interest out there, of many types that are aligned with a particular party's ideology. So some interest groups are aligned with the left, some interest groups are aligned with the right, and what parties have done is they've divided the voters that they care about into these two mutually exclusive groups. And that's the way they think about how to compete and what customers they really want to serve. Um, and uh, that means that uh, the, who's left, not in those two core groups, the average, the average voter, the you know, nonpartisan voter, uh, is stuck with only these two very extreme choices. And Catherine has explained why with only two, and if they're so different, it's very hard to, to switching doesn't happen. Um, and uh, uh, so the duopoly doesn't need to deliver results in order 
to win elections. I mean, if you look at the slides I showed you earlier, our government has delivered pretty much nothing for decades, except highly partisan stuff that ultimately has been attacked and, and you know, focused to uh, efforts to repeal. Um, why do we have the same parties competing in the same way? Well, uh, the answer is that because the uh, choices are very extreme, uh, in effect, nobody switches. Very few switch because, the, because of that extremity that Catherine uh, described. Now, to get even more problematic here, what do the parties actually compete on? Uh, and the answer is they don't compete on solving problems. They compete on advancing their ideology, whatever that is. Um, now, what do we know about ideology? And, and I hope I'm not going to offend anybody here. What we know about ideology is it's a cartoon of the world. It's not real. It's too simple. We know that almost every important issue, to resolve that issue, we have to take into account multiple points of view of multiple types of people that cuts across ideology. Uh, we've got a, it's, it's this complex compromise and integration and, and insight into how to put together a package of things that actually will work that is critical to government working effectively. Uh, but what the parties do instead is they sort of create a false choice. A good example would be free trade, which is more right, and um, uh, protectionism, which is more on the left. We've got to protect ourselves. Okay? Now, the parties will tell you those are two choices. And the answer is neither of them is a real choice. They're all more complicated. The real uh, trade policy that we need is some complicated mixture of the two that reflects the reality of how the international economy works and so forth and so on. This is one of many false choices. The parties give us false choices between this and that that aren't real choices. The answer is somewhere uh, in a more complicated center. Uh, and, and what the parties have also done is we, if we're not on their side, they call us the enemy. Not just a citizen of America that has relevant and appropriate interests that ought to be served as well. Uh, uh, that's not the way the competition works. Now, the partisan competition is amplified not only by this kind of strategy that the parties use, but also by the uh, kind of connection the parties have built with the suppliers and the channels. Uh, what we see is that um, uh, the parties actually control their suppliers. So you're either a Democrat campaign manager or a Republican campaign manager. You can't switch. Or you're done. Your career is over. Uh, the same is true uh, in, in many of the other suppliers. The voter data company is either left or right, and so forth. And the channels are, are connected. Uh, the media have now divided. So that there's this media for this group and this media for this group, and they don't switch. And what this means is the parties get even more uh, power and control and even more incentive for partisanships by this structure that's, that's been put in place. Um, also, uh, and, and we're kind of starting to kind of get to the end of understanding this complicated game, Despite the failure of, de of delivering good for the citizens, for the public, given all the dissatisfaction scores you just saw, the reason that there's no new competition is because, as Catherine uh, mentioned, there's high barriers to entry. There's economies of scale locking up suppliers, locking up the channels, uh, huge uh, uh, economies of scale from running elections all over the country. A, a new party has, has no shot uh, in this world. And, uh, uh, we see uh, that the parties also cooperate. So the irony here is at the same time as they're competing, they are cooperating. And what are they cooperating to do? To set the rules for elections and governing to benefit them and to reinforce the partisan divide, which is the whole kind of strategy that is driving uh, the way our political system works today. An example, just, just to give you one, is uh, fundraising rules. Do you, do you know that if you want to give money to a candidate or committee of a national party, a uh, Democrat or Republican, you can give, a single donor can give $847,500 per year 
to a candidate, if they're a major party candidate. If you want to give money to an independent, you know how much you can give? 5,400 per two-year cycle. So that's 313 times more in the rules set by the parties you can give to their candidate versus the rules that are set for independents and independents running. So when we put all this together, we end up with three very, very distressing uh, implications. One, the parties and the complex around them don't really want to solve the nation's problems. Not really. Uh, they like issues to fester. They like there to be wedge issues where the partisans on either side are energized to support their party. That's not what the citizens want, but that's what the parties want. They prefer gridlock to compromise. It happens over and over again. And by the way, it's both parties. All of this is both parties. It's not one or the other. We also have seen that the parties have infiltrated our government, not just legislating. Uh, partisan competition has now extended to our executive agencies in government, our regulatory agencies like the FTC, and our courts. It used to be that to get made a head of an agency or appointed as a judge, you had to demonstrate competence and even handedness. Now, the only way to get one of those jobs is to be a very loyal partisan. And so the ability to have consensus and, 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 and votes where, where everybody votes together, uh, th those days are almost over. Finally, uh, and I think this should be clear at this point uh, from what we've already said, there's no countervailing forces right now to change any of this. Despite the fact that there's overwhelming dissatisfaction, there's still no accountability to the parties. Nothing is changing. What do we have to do? We have to change the rules that are distorting the competition that we are forced to participate in. Uh, now, to understand how to do that uh, and to get, hopefully, a little bit of optimism and excitement about our possibilities in America, let me turn it back over to Catherine. So actually, we've arrived at the lots of optimism section. Um, I want to summarize the theory of change. In any game, board games, sports games, serious games like politics, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of the game. So you can change the rules of the game, for example, in basketball, and institute a three-point line, and you change the way the game is played to change the outcomes. You can change the rules of the game in any industry and get different behavior. And we can do that in politics, because remember, the rules aren't fundamentally in the Constitution. They've been made up. The problem, as I said before, is that the rules have been made up to serve partisans, not to solve problems. So to transform the system, we have to re-engineer the rules of the game to incent healthy competition on dimensions that matter to the public interest. What we need is a comprehensive innovation strategy. And every innovation in the strategy is at the intersection of another Venn diagram, what we call powerful and achievable. So anything we recommend is powerful, meaning that innovation addresses a root cause of the political dysfunction. And additionally, it's got to be achievable for us to recommend it. And by achievable, we mean two things. One, it's not a Trojan horse for either party's advantage. And two, we can theoretically measure success in years, not decades. So for example, constitutional amendments need not apply to be in this strategy. Only innovations that are in this intersection do we have. So let's take a look at what that is. Fundamentally, our, we have a comprehensive strategy with three pillars, re-engineering elections, re-engineering the legislative machinery, which is all of this, and also opening up near-term competition. But today, I'm going to focus only on the first, and that's the election machinery, changing the rules for how we vote. The reason is because these solutions are the most powerful progress-driven disruptors that we can achieve much sooner than many of us would have thought. So let me back up for a moment. There's two critical structural problems with our existing elections. First of all, the partisan primaries, which we already talked about, think of them as creating 
sort of a proverbial eye of the needle through which no problem-solving politician may pass. The second problem is plurality voting, which we haven't talked about yet, but let's think about it. In the United States, elections can usually be won with having the most votes, a plurality of votes, even if you don't have a true majority. For example, in a three-ray race, you could win with 34%. But that would mean, at the same time, that 66% of voters preferred someone else. And plurality voting is, believe it or not, the single greatest structural impediment to new competition. And the reason is a spoiler argument, which I'll explain. So sometimes we don't vote for the candidate we really want out of fear that we will inadvertently contribute to the election of the candidate that we like the least. So for example, in 2016, you're not supposed to vote for Jill Stein because you'll take votes away from Hillary, spoil the election for her, and help elect Donald Trump. You're also not supposed to vote for libertarian Gary Johnson because you'll take votes away from Trump, spoil the election for him, and inadvertently help elect Hillary. And if you think about it, earlier this year, you may have seen that Howard Schultz, former CEO of Starbucks, was exploring an independent run for the president. And the Democrats were really up in arms. In that case, basically, they came out and said, not only are you not supposed to vote for Howard Schultz, he wasn't even supposed to be allowed to run. And if we think about it, politics is the only industry where we're regularly told that less competition is good for the customer. But as we saw in the Howard Schultz case, this structural problem of spoilers being created when there's new competition is what's wielded against all the potential competition outside the duopoly. And it's the key reason why most potential competition never even makes it to the starting line. The two elections innovations that we propose, when implemented as a, as a package, will fundamentally change what politicians are incented to do. Elections machinery innovation number one is to institute top four primaries. And here's how that works. You go to vote. And we have eliminated, in your primary, we've eliminated partisan primaries where you vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary. Now when you show up on primary day, there's only one single ballot, and everybody running is on the same ballot. You pick your favorite. When the election is over, the top four finishers automatically advance to the general election. So you can have more than one Republican, more than one Democrat advancing, as well as independents, Greens, new parties. Election machinery number two is to institute, oh, I'm sorry, um, top four primaries this way is what would eliminate the eye of the needle partisan primary problem and thus allow legislators significantly more leeway to legislate in the public interest. Election machinery innovation number two is to institute ranked choice voting in the general elections. And here's how that works. So now you have the top four finishers on the ballot. And when you go to vote, you see your four choices, and it's easy. You pick your favorite, just like always. But then if you would like, you can also select your second choice, your third choice, and your last choice. You can rank as many or as few as you want. Here's a sample ballot in um, my ranked choice voting election. So in this case, Alexander Hamilton is my favorite because I like the musical. And then I choose uh, Thomas, oh, uh, George Washington second, Thomas Jefferson third, and my last choice is James Madison. Now imagine the polls close. The first place votes are counted, and if someone gets a true majority, then the election's over. That candidate wins. But if after the first place votes are counted, nobody has a true, the leader doesn't have a true majority, then the candidate that came in last place is dropped from the election. And voters who had selected the candidate who is now out have their second choice vote counted instead. And you recount the votes until, the, until you have a true majority winner. It's basically just a series of runoffs. But instead of having to come back for another election, you cast all your votes at once. Ranked choice voting eliminates the spoiler argument and ensures we always elect the candidate with the broadest appeal 
to the most number of voters. And these are not crazy new ideas, by the way. All the way back in 2002, we had uh, in Alaska a referendum to institute ranked choice voting. And a famous politician recorded a robocall supporting that referendum. Let's listen. Hello, this is Senator John McCain. I'm calling to urge your support for ballot measure one on August 27th. As a presidential candidate and as a senator, I've worked hard to open up the political process for all Americans. Ballot measure one will adopt a fairer voting method. It will lead to good government because Alaska will elect leaders who have the support of a majority of voters. Please vote yes on measure one on August 27th. And also in 2002, in Illinois, where I lived, we had Illinois Senate Bill 1789 proposing ranked choice voting for all congressional and state primaries. The sponsor, then state senator, Barack Obama. John McCain and Barack Obama, two talented politicians who absolutely knew how the game is played. They were ahead of their time on reform, but now that time has come. Together, these reforms, top four primaries, plus ranked choice voting in the general as a package, will powerfully alter incentives and support the reinvigoration of the political middle. So let's reimagine Congress post-election machinery reform. Now, when members of Congress are presented with that same opportunity to solve, potentially the, to, to vote yes on the same bill we talked about earlier, a compromise bipartisan measure on our biggest problems, they can vote yes if it's in the public interest. They can say, well, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my partisan primary if I voted for this. But under the new system, I'm pretty confident I can survive in the top four in the primary, and then in the general election appealing to everybody in my district with a combination of first and second place votes, I'll be able to craft a win. Under this system, elected officials now owe their election to a broader group of voters and are incented to be responsive to their entire district rather than to a narrow swath of primary voters and special interests. And the existing incentives for scorch earth campaigning are reduced. But most importantly for our country, the barriers to new competition are dramatically lower leading to healthy competition to serve the public interest. So let's revisit our initial Venn diagram, and we are almost done. Here was our current unhealthy competition. Under the current rules of the game, there's no intersection between doing what needs doing and getting reelected. But here it is with the solution. We implement election innovations, top four primaries, ranked choice voting general, and we create that intersection so the actors in the politics industry are now incented to do what we as a country need them to do, and that is the very exciting power of political innovation. So what's next? We need to implement top four primaries ranked choice voting across the country. The Constitution delegates versus virtually everything about elections to the state, so each state has to do this individually. And it's an incredibly exciting time right now because there are campaigns for these reforms being created all over the country. And one year ago, this month, the state of Maine became the first state in the country to pass ranked choice voting. The results came in after midnight, and I actually woke my daughter up at her request, because she knew, because I told her, but she knew, <laughs> that this was the most important election of her lifetime to date. Of course, this effort takes resources, and everyone asks what it's going to cost, and it's a totally reasonable question. I believe the political philanthropy, what we call a special interest for the general interest, offers the best potential ROI of any philanthropy out there. And the dollars aren't actually as prohibitive as we might think. So signers of the Bill and Melinda Gates Giving Pledge, for example, have collectively pledged over $400 billion. And all Americans annually give another $400 billion. And the cost to deliver top four and RCV per state, well, it's anywhere from $5 million in a small legislative state to $20 million in a large referendum state like California. So if we take even an aggressive average of $15 million per state, that gives us $300 million to deliver this in 20 states. 
And 300 million is less than 5% of the billions that were spent in 2016 federal elections alone. And yet, this 300 million for top four RCV is far more likely to sustainably impact the effectiveness of $4 trillion of government spending and to transform the trajectory of our democracy. So this is both powerful and achievable. Historically, the, United, uh, the American political system was the foundation of United States success, and today it stands in the way of every important issue we need to address. Yet we have every reason to be optimistic, I believe even profoundly optimistic, because uh, the reasons for our dysfunction are not a mystery, and we have a strategy for transformation. This country was founded on the greatest political innovation of all times, and one of modern times, and once again, political innovation is the key to our future. So I'd like to close with an invitation to action. Thomas Jefferson is said to have said, my HBS fact checker said he didn't really say it, but he should have. <laughs> In America, we don't have government by the majority, we have government by the majority who participate. And historically, for most of us, we've thought that meant we need to participate by voting. But it turns out that what it means is that we also need to participate in the design of the rules of this most important game. So imagine our political system restored to order. Imagine our elected representatives tackling our greatest challenges, paving the way for a bigger and brighter future than any of us have been able to dare to dream in the last number of years. Imagine our democracy reinvigorated a beacon to the world, reclaiming the promise of our republic. The great American experiment is the challenge and the opportunity of our times. And together, we can deliver that promise for us and for future generations. Thank you so much. Please join us. <laughs>